I'm going to talk today about the ethical theory of Immanuel Kant. Now, uh, I will try to restrain myself, but you should probably be made to understand at the outset here that Kant is, in my view, the most important philosopher since the ancient Greeks. Uh, that is, in the last 2,000 years. His influence on philosophy can scarcely be uh, overestimated. He wrote very widely. He wrote not just about ethics, but also about metaphysics. And, and his ideas uh, have really had a, a lasting impact on philosophy as we understand it even today. Uh, it wasn't just breakthrough philosophy for his time. It's really the kind of uh, writing that's had an effect even now. We still we still really feel it even today. Um, today's lecture, I'm going to break it down into four main points. I'm first going to talk about a, a family of ethical theories called deontology or deontological theories. D-E-O-N-T-O-L-O-G-Y. Uh, Kant's view is one of these deontological theories. So I'll say a word about the nature of that that family of ethical theory. Then I'll say a word about um, Kant's famous claim that the only thing that's good in itself is a good will. And then I'll move toward Kant's ideas about what the, uh, the aim or end of humanity might be or must be. Kant had some important things to say about that. And finally, fourth, I'll say a bit about what Kant took a good will to be, took a good will to consist in. And this will start to get us uh, into where Kant's theory really takes off. I'll be um, relying mostly on Kant's famous work, uh, Groundwork for the Metaphysics of Morals. This is a seminal work. It's, it's um, a relatively short book, especially by Kant's standards, uh, and he certainly wrote many other things about ethics, um, but this particular book, as the name suggests, is really sort of the, the underpinning for the whole theory. It, it's, um, it reveals a lot about how Kant was thinking about the very enterprise of doing ethical theory in the first place. Um, it's justly famous. It's not uh, so difficult to read. Again, that's partly just relative to Kant's standards. Um, but it's awfully rewarding, and, and I hope you find it find it as interesting as I do. Okay, so first, about deontology. Well, if you remember when we were talking about Mill, we classified Mill's view as a kind of consequentialist theory. That is, a theory according to which the right thing to do is to maximize the good. Okay, so we... We think about the actions that are available to us. We measure those actions in terms of the quality of the consequences that they would produce if performed. And then we choose among those actions the one that will produce the best consequences. Okay. And that's a sort of storybook picture of consequentialism. <clears throat> uh, so notice in particular that right action is tied directly to good consequences. Right? So in effect, we define rightness or wrongness of actions in terms of the quality of the consequences that they produce. And the deontological family of theories can basically be defi defined as the denial of that. Okay, so the idea is going to be that um, when you're thinking about what the right action is, you cannot just simply base it on what the values of the consequences are that would be produced by the various actions open to you. Okay? So th that's the thesis of deontology, that, that in fact, it's often put this way, in fact there are constraints upon our maximizing the good. Now, there's a kind of paradox associated with deontology, often just called the paradox of deontology. Uh, and it falls right out of this definition, because the, the idea is supposed to be that it's counterintuitive to suggest that it could ever be somehow wrong or imp 
impermissible not to maximize the good, right? How could it ever be a bad thing, uh, or the wrong thing anyway, to, um, to try to bring about as much good as you possibly can, right? How could that possibly be, be appropriate? Um, but nevertheless, that is, in fact, the deontologist view, and I think, uh, I think you don't have to go very far by way of examples to get a sense of how deontological theory could work and, and um, how, according to me anyway, uh, non-paradoxical it really, really can seem if it's, if it's um, put together well. Kant's theory, I think, is certainly put together well, and I think you'll see that it's really not so paradoxical at the end. It, it's got, uh, it's got uh, difficulties of its own, of course, but I think that um, this early worry about the very nature of the ontology is, is uh, um, pretty easily set aside just by the, the power and elegance of Kant's, Kant's theory. Okay, so that's deontology, the idea that uh, the rightness or wrongness of an action <clears throat> is not simply a measure of the value of the consequences that those actions produce. That, in fact, sometimes we have obligations to perform actions that do not maximize the good. Okay. Um, now, the next topic for us is Kant's famous claim that there's nothing good in itself other than a good will. And I think when we explore this, we'll see how a deontological picture might, might work. So let's get to that famous claim. The idea is nothing is good in itself. That is, remember our notion about intrinsic goodness. That's what Kant is speaking about here. There's nothing that's good in and of itself except a good will. That is, uh, good intentions, a desire to do good. Uh, will, of course, being a sort of somewhat old view for that faculty of soul that, that allows us to move ourselves, allows us to act. Okay. Um, there are, of course, famous puzzles about whether the will is free and so on, but, but Kant certainly thought that it was, and um, given that it's free, wills can be either good or bad, and Kant is saying now that those, the good wills are the things that are good in themselves. Now, if we're saying that wills, a good will is good in itself, and that's the only thing that's good in itself, then, of course, we're denying that other things are good in themselves. Most obviously, things like happiness or pleasure or health or anything of that sort. Mill, of course, famously says that happiness is good in itself, uh, and Kant famously denies that. Right? And Kant's idea here, I think, is, is something like the following. Um, well, sure, in many cases, human happiness is a good thing. Uh, it, for most people, it is a good thing. But suppose that someone takes happiness in perverse things. Okay. It doesn't seem to be uh, uh, helpful at all if the child abuser uh, takes pleasure in his abuse. Right? We might... We certainly condemn the action in any case. But if we're utilitarians like Mill, we think that the, that, uh, the wrongness of the abuse is mitigated to some extent by the happiness that the abuser might take in doing it. And Kant is not saying, oh, but that doesn't help at all, right? In fact, if we learn that you know, a child abuser takes pleasure in doing his abuse, we might decide that the, the thing is worse than we thought before, and certainly not better. Right? So the idea is that, well, happiness is a good and fine thing for many people, but it's not always good. And so it can't therefore be good in and of itself. If it were, then the happiness of the child abuser would be good. But in fact, of course, it's not. Okay. Um, and moreover, Kant says, no matter what faculty of of uh, so what feature of a personality we can imagine, well, any such feature would be good only in conjunction with a good will. So, for example, take something like intelligence, 